this is the final message of this series of living the unashamed lifestyle. And I said on last week that, um, in my opinion, this has been, no, this has been one of the most profound messages for me that God has given me all year long. It has blessed me the most. By the same token, it has been the most difficult for me to articulate what it is that God has said to me, and I've been trying to do a better job um, in that. So we're going to dive just a little bit deeper with this final thought uh, before we transition to our new series in the next couple of weeks. Philippians chapter number one, verses number 12, the Apostle Paul writes, and he says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, somebody shout, what happened to me, has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. 14 declares, and because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. 15 says, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry. He says, so there's some that's doing it with the wrong motives, but nevertheless, I rejoice because he's being preached, but others out of goodwill. 19 says, for I know that through your prayers, that's so powerful, and God's provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed. But we'll have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body. Whether I live or whether I die, Christ will be exalted in my body. Father, now in Jesus' name, I want to thank you so much for this opportunity to minister the word of God to the people of God, hiding myself now behind the cross that men may not see. Give honor, glory to Greg. I thank you now for who you are. Thank you for what you're doing in this hour. And it is in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody says. So um, throughout the year, at least once a year, um, these are groups of questions that I kind of receive as a pastor. Um, usually it's after someone has has passed away, there's a terminal illness that someone has been diagnosed with, some catastrophic event, a Hurricane Katrina comes through and just wipes everything away. And so people want to know, why do bad things happen to good people? They pose the question, um, how can a good God allow bad things if he's really good? And then there are some who frame it just a little bit more theologically. They say, how can an all-knowing and all loving God foresee my pain and not stop it. Somebody shout, that's a problem. <laughs> I mean, because if, if God is omniscient, all knowing, he is all loving, how can he know the problem that's going to hurt me and then say he loved me and not do something about the problem that he sees is getting ready to it's almost like a parent. If you see something tragic getting ready to happen to one of your babies and you say you love them, you're going to try to save them. So th there's this, this, this conflict sometimes in our faith. And, and as a, here's my problem sometimes in answering it. Sometimes I have to wrestle between being theologically versus being pastoral. Because as soon as somebody throws a question at me, usually I lean more towards the, the, the theologian. So I talk about um, the reality that there's a real devil. The Bible declares that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, power, spiritual wickedness. And so, so there is a real spiritual battle that's going on. I'll talk about that. Or I may talk about the fact that this world that we're currently living in is not the way God originally designed it. He designed the earth perfectly. And because of the failure of man, the Bible declares sin entered the world, death by sin. So, so there are a lot of things that, that happen. Birth defects, they, they just happen. Hurricanes, the tsunamis, they, tsunamis, they happen because this world, this earth is not the way God originally intended. Or uh, sometimes I'll just talk about the will of man, which is one of the most dominant factors in the earth because God has chosen not to violate the will of a man. In other sense, God won't make you love him. It would be easy if God would make me like a robot and just make me do what's right. I mean, wouldn't that be easier, y'all? I would, I'd sign up for that. God, just hit that button in me. Hit the do right button in me. So I just continue to do right all the time. But God would not violate the will of a man, and, and because he won't do that, there are times when mankind willingly chooses to do the opposite of what God desires, which leads hurting, violating sometimes, other people because they've chosen 
Now, in the end, God is going to cause that man to give an account of his actions, but God won't make him love him. That's the theological answer. But I've given that answer many times, and people have still walked away hurt because they asked the theological question, but they really didn't want a theological answer. They were looking for more of a pastoral answer. And so over my years of experience, instead of trying to be the theologian, I've leaned more towards pastoral care, and I understand what the driving factor is behind the question, why do bad things happen to good people? And the driving force is shame. So it's like this. It's not why or how can something bad happen to somebody that's good? How can an all-knowing, all-loving God allow something to happen and not stop it? The reality is this. This just not supposed to happen to me. <laughs> yeah. There's some things that happened in my past that I could point to that if it happened five years ago, it was justifiable. But now a brother trying to actually live right. <laughs> I'm in the church now. <laughs> things not supposed to be happening. And people around me don't make it no bit. I thought you was a Christian. How is happening to you when you saved? You don't, no, no, serious, serious. Th there have been two times in my life, one, uh, two and a half, three years ago when my sister passed. Watch this. That was not so, my sister died. Was not, it ain't that it, was supposed, it wasn't supposed to happen to her. Watch this. It wasn't supposed to happen to me. Man of God, man of faith. I pray for folks. I've seen people come back from death's door. I've seen the miracle uh, working power of God. I've said that just wasn't supposed to happen to, to me. My, my first funeral and my first eulogy was, was my son, Nathaniel, uh, Robert Nathaniel. First eulogy, first funeral that I did. It hurt that it happened, but what really hurt was the shame that you the man of God and something like this can happen to <laughs> so, so So this is what we've been saying for the past couple of weeks. We've been saying that shame is a tool of the enemy. It really is. But, but today, I, I want to highlight why the enemy uses shame as a tool. Because we've been saying that, okay, so the enemy, he brings particular things in your life sometimes uh, uh, just for the express purpose of keeping you focused on what happened so you never look at what can possibly happen if you keep moving forward. So, so, so shame, shame is a tool of the enemy, but here's, here's the reason why. Shame robs you of the boldness of your testimony. Now, I need you to hear this. It, it robs you. This is why the enemy keeps bombarding you with these things that depress you because he knows that shame robs you of your testimony. And this is why Romans, tw excuse me, Revelation 12, 11, the Bible declares, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by what, y'all? And by the word of their testimony. So when it comes to a testimony, we often think of a testimony just encouraging motivating somebody else in a bad situation. But in all actuality, your testimony is not just for somebody else, but your testimony is really for you. Because the more you remind yourself of what God did for you, come on somebody, the more encouraged you are that if he did it before, he'll do it again. Same God, God right now. Same God back then. So, so in this particular text, on um, the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul is in a bad situation. Bruh man locked up. <laughs> he in jail. <laughs> now, some of y'all looking around like, I mean, okay, he in jail. Because we're really not surprised about that because Paul is, goes to jail a lot. <laughs> and man of God go to jail a lot. <laughs> he wrote half of two-thirds of the New Testament and half of the books that he wrote, he was in jail. <laughs> No, no, we this modern day uh, church, we're not too messed up about that. But let's 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 kind of contemporize this thing just for a moment. Um, I was min uh, talking to Minister El Evelyn after prayer, and uh, she was just so you were just so bubbly and excited this morning, just so excited. <laughs> she came to me. She said, "Pastor, I've been talking about the church, and I've been talking about you. God's been good to us." I said, go, girl. And so she just started talking about stuff. Da, 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 da. And I'm standing there as a, as a proud pastor. Because she talked about her pastor, y'all. Now, I don't know who she was talking to me in front of, but I could just imagine the people around her like, ooh, she love her pastor. Don't you love you? Girl, you love your pastor. I can see that. 
Now, now, now let's, let's reframe this, this testimony that she has. And let's put it, where we're going to put it? Where we gonna, we're going to put it in the hair salon. What's the name of your spot? We're going to put it in the sleigh station. I heard that. So she in the sleigh station. Lex is doing up, Lex is slaying them heads <laughs> in the spirit, y'all. <laughs> so watch this, watch this. Minister Evelyn walk in. Hey, how y'all doing? Praise the Lord. I just want to tell y'all about my church, Empowerment Ministries Christian Center. And my pastor, he is an awesome, what is it, y'all? What is it? What is it? Come on, talk to me. He's all, I love it, y'all. Woo! He's a, 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 what, what? He's a mighty man of God. <laughs> Girl, he's so, he's so, a, he's, he's so, a, 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 he's, y'all can, y'all help me with, he is anointed, y'all. He is anointed. And so she just going on and on and on about her, her, her pastor. And, and watch this, watch this. Brother man just sitting there and, and they said, hey, oh, you say, is, is that, is that the church where the pastor went to jail? No. <laughs> the devil is a lie. <laughs> and I'm going to say it right now, the devil is a lie. Because <laughs> you know I don't plan to go to jail nor hell. Can somebody say amen to that? <laughs> amen. Before she answers back to negate what was said, just feel the shame in the air just for a second. Because you don't mind your own business. You ain't even studying her. I mean, you hear, but you ain't really studying her. She talking about her little church, talking about her little pastor. But when brother man said, ain't that the one with the jail? Watch this. Watch it. Just put your phone down. <laughs> Let me see. Because there, there's, a, there's a level of shame because the one that you're talking about so mighty, <laughs> he in jail. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So... Paul is experiencing this same shame in the atmosphere because this is a man of God that started a church. And watch this. The man who started the church, he in jail. He in prison. He ain't going to come home no time soon. The only preaching he's going to be doing, letters. So if you can imagine being a part of the church of Philippi, yeah, I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and, and I, I love the Lord, and, and hold on, hold on, hold on, saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost, filled. Ain't your pastor in jail? <laughs> or imagine being the Roman guard, having a guard, Paul, the great man of God. Ain't doing too much preaching now, are you, player? So this is what, this is, so, so I, I got to deal with this because if the devil can't shame you by what you have done in the past, because some of us are past that, praise the Lord. If he can't shame you by what you've done in the past, he'll try to shame you by what you perceive God is not doing in your present. So if he can't get you by what you did, well, what about what God ain't doing? Because how, how can he allow something like this to happen to one of his children? So, so this is Paul's testimony, and I, I just want to, uh, I want to, I want to just highlight two two things that help Paul to get over this shameful situation. And, and if you're taking notes, just jot this down. Take th- these two things. Number one, stop looking at what God allowed and focus on what He is doing. Okay, stop. Just, if you take a note, jot, jot it down. If you're not taking note, because if you're not going through it now, you're gonna need it. I promise you, you're gonna need it one day. You got to stop focusing on what God allowed because he will allow some certain things. And put your attention on what he's actually doing in the midst of the situation that you're currently going through. That, that's, the, that's the first thing. The second thing that we're going to talk about is a challenge to reevaluate your basis of shame. Because some of you guys, you base your shame... There are some things you should be shameful for, but we as believers can't base our level of shame on the same standard that the world has. Can, can, we, can we dive a little bit deeper? Y'all follow me. So Paul writes, Philippians 1, 12, he says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, 
I'm in jail, y'all, has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. So watch this. If you read throughout the book of Acts, Paul was always headed to Rome, but it seems like it was difficult for him to get there. I want to help somebody in here. So you know what God did? God allowed trouble to be his transportation to Rome so that he could preach. He preached, but he just didn't preach on the platform he thought he would. Anybody know what it's like to have a car that you hate, but it gets you from point A to point B? <laughs> I've had several in my li lifetime. I had a car. I had a car. I had to pray every time I got in it because it had a transmission that was slipping. <laughs> but I wasn't ready to spend $2,000, so I prayed. And sometimes I glided while I prayed. Wasn't the transportation that I wanted, but it was the transportation that I had to get from point A to point B. And God, he, he's not looking at what God allowed. He's looking at what God is doing. I've been trying to get to Rome anyway, but if this is the way that God wants me to go, I'm submitting to the way God has provided for me to go. I'm in jail, but everybody in jail is hearing about Jesus. Not just the captains, but those who are guarding me who has the privilege to come in and out of jail, I'm converting them, and they're in turn leaving and converting their whole household. Y'all ain't saying nothing in this place. So not only prisoners are being saved, but the guards are being saved. And because the guards are being saved, the families of the guards stop focusing on what God is allowing and focus on what he's currently. 14 says, and because of my chains, this, this is good. Most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. They're like, well, shoot, if Paul in jail preaching, I'm free. What's stopping me from preaching right here? They're becoming more confident in witnessing because Paul refused to allow shame, the shame of his situation, to stop him from being bold in Christ. The devil uses shame as a tool and the what. What shame does is it, it tries to mar you or rob you of the confidence of your testimony. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't let him do it. 119 in the Message Bible, it says, because I know how it's going to turn out. Now, this, this is good now. He says, I'm in a bad situation. See, it, you, sometimes it takes walking with God a while to build this kind of confidence. So I'm, don't, don't beat yourself up. You, Sometimes it takes you going through a few battles yourself to, to just know how it's going. <laughs> this is a, you, you're in a good place when you're right there. When trouble comes, you, you don't buckle and you don't bow because you know how this is going to turn out. Watch this. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Is that right? But God delivers them out of them all. For somebody, you know, a little weak in their faith, they just see many are the afflictions. But for somebody that's just a, just a little season, they know afflictions come, but God delivers us out of them. Paul said, I know how this is going to turn out. I ain't even tripping no more. Oh, Lord, Paul in jail again. You, you ain't got to cry for me. <laughs> I'm okay. Dry your tears because I know how this is going to turn out. Watch this. Through your, somebody shout faithful prayers. I'm going to come back to that. Faithful prayers and the generous response of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Everything he wants to do in and through me will be done. Let's back up. Through your, somebody shout faithful. Now, now, this is what you got to understand about faith. I want to help you to add to your definition because many of us, when we define faith, we define faith in a forward-moving position. Faith is always me uh, gaining ground. Faith is always me acquiring things. But there's another level of faith that is not me moving forward, but it's sometimes standing still when everything else is falling around me. Watch this, watch this. I didn't get an addition to my house. It just didn't fall down when the hurricane came through. So my faith is not always moving forward, but sometimes it's just simply standing still. And he says, I'm relying on your faithful prayers of you standing there interceding and the generous response of the spirit of Jesus Christ. Everything, this is confidence, y'all, everything he wants to do in and through me, it will, somebody shout, it will be done. Now, now I, I need y'all to help me and I need you to help yourself. I need you to say this with me. Somebody shout, everything that God wants to do in and through me will be done. Now somebody shout, nah, devil. I see what you're doing. I saw what you threw at me. You ain't saying nothing in this place. But despite what I'm currently going through right now, every 
everything that God wants to do in me and through me, it will be done. Can you say amen? 20 says, I can hardly wait to continue my course. Man, there's a man in jail talking about something. I can't, girl, girl, I can hardly wait to finish my course in jail. But he's confident that God is going to come through. Some of us are stuck right now. We're stuck right now because we're still surprised that it happened. And I can understand. I can, watch, this, watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Come here. Come here. Jack, come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Y'all know this story. Y'all know this story. Y'all know this story. Y'all know this story. Give me a little music, Chris. Anything. Just some quick. Some quick. Some quick. Some quick. Some quick. When the music come on, everybody bow your head. Just bow your head. Come on. Real quick. Real quick. Real quick. Real. <laughs> watch this. Real quick. Why you here? Not y'all. Cut. Cut it. Y'all lift your heads up. Do it again. Do it again. Lift it up now. Now hold, 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 hold. I don't know about y'all, but King, we won't bow. Because we know our God is able. And just in case he don't, we still know he able. Now, now, now press pause. Press pause for a second. Because you would think right then, j just in case he don't, we still ain't about. Right then you would think the angel of the Lord would come through. But you know what happened? Come on. How is it that we this faithful standing up for God and we still get thrown in the fiery furnace? And some of y'all are stuck on that you got thrown in, but you forgetting what God is currently doing to get you. It's not about what happened. It's about what God is doing. Somebody shout right now. Paul said, I'm in jail. <laughs> I'd prefer to be out on the street preaching, but it's working together. And he says, I can, I'm still shackled, but I can hardly wait to continue my course because I see what God. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, just open your eyes. You just need to open your eyes and see. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He says, I don't expect to be embarrassed in the least. NIV says, I don't expect to be ashamed. I'm not going to be ashamed of this. Mm -mm. I see what God's doing with this. So I don't expect to be embarrassed. Yeah, it happened. Yeah, yeah, it happened. But I'm not going to be embarrassed. On the contrary, everything happening to me in this jail only serves to make Christ more accurately known. Regardless of whether I live or die. They threaten in my life, but that's cool too. Because to live is Christ. Come on, to die is what, y'all? It's gain. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So if you kill me, you're doing me a favor. He says, everything happening to me in this jail only serves to make Christ more accurately known. Regardless of whether I live or die, they didn't shut me up. When they put me in jail, they gave me a pulpit. They gave me a platform. I wonder, can you see what God is doing even in the midst of your situation right now? When the rest of the world is trying to actually shame you for where you are, God is working in where you are. Now, let's, let's take a little bit deeper because uh, stop looking at what God allowed. Focus on what he's doing. And, and here, here's the second thing, and I'm hanging my hat and I'm done. Reevaluate your basis of shame. I, I need you to re just, I need you to reevaluate. Because this, this is what the world wants to do. So, so, so this is my deal, man. I don't fly a whole lot. I really don't fly a whole lot. Uh, maybe just a couple times a year we, we'll go somewhere. Um, and, and I really hate airplane talk. I hate airplane talk. And people next to me sometimes seem not to get it. Because earbuds in ears is the universal sign. I don't want to be bothered. But nevertheless, 
And, and so I, I got this thing when people say, so, so t- tell me. So I, I, I do it dramatically. <sighs> yes, sir. So, so tell me, what do you do? Now, let me, let me tell you, nine and a half times out of ten, nine and a half times out of ten, not every time, because there are times I ask because I generally, I really, usually when I ask what you do, wanna, what you do, I really want to know. But usually people, when they ask you what you do, they're trying to rank you. Watch, watch this, watch this. So tell me, what do you do? I work for the bank. Bam. Really? What do you do in the bank? Oh, I'm in engineering. Wow, I didn't know the bank had engineers. What, what does the engineer do? Well, we just basically do the floors. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm serious. So the question is about a ranking system. And if you are high rank, you get high honor. The lower you rank, the more shame you get. Oh, that's all you do is, is, is floors? And, and please don't don't take that personal. I'm not trying to demean that job. But it's it's important as well. Um, how many of you guys hate going to a? How many of you guys leave a restroom? Leave a restaurant if the bathroom is dirty. I'm out of here. Cause if the cook washing his hands in this, he don't need to be touching y'all. <laughs> okay, so we got it. So 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 this is what Paul understands, and this is what helps him not to deal, not to embrace the shame with his current situation because he refuses to allow the world, he refuses to allow his self-esteem to be hinged upon the world's ranking system. And there are many of you guys right now, some of you guys are borderline prideful, others of you guys are borderline suicidal, not because of the God you serve, but simply because you have allowed the world's ranking system to determine your level of self-worth and self-value because the world says you graduated from here and you got this and you did that you borderline full of pride because the world says you should have it you should have this by now you should be this by now you should be you should be that by now and because you're not that by now so 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 this is how Paul de- deals with this watch this Paul says whatever happens rejoice in the Lord <laughs> I'm going to help you with the context of the moment. He said, whatever happens, rejoice in Jesus. Somebody shout whatever. Okay. So I'm, I'm just going to throw a scenario and just somebody shout, thank you, Jesus. All right. So here it is. Here's a scenario. Good times. Bad times. Got paid. Broke. Oh, 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 oh no, 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 no. Back, back, back up, back up, back up, back up, back up. Back up. Yeah, yeah. So, so I said, I said, good times. Y'all were like, thank you, Jesus. I said, bad times. Y'all said, thank you, Jesus. I said, y'all got paid. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you now. <laughs> Jesus, come now. Oh, no, no, no. Let, let's, let's keep it. Let's keep it here. Because what you're telling me is the devil knows how to push your emotional buttons. By afflicting situations, uh, see, 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 and this is not a spiritual warfare, but I, I have, I have been in a spiritual battle for the past couple of weeks. N- now, nothing, not, you know, God and the Holy Spirit and all that kind of stuff can't handle. But I, s- s- um, my wife, she, she was talking to uh, Minister uh, Yafrika a couple of weeks ago, and um, uh, uh, my wife said the devil must be mad because we, I mean, we've just been been crazy and so yeah i said i know he's mad with everything that we're doing in ministry the approach of the women's conference and ev- what it does in women every single year this this free let me tell y'all has freedom been good for y'all okay press pause it's been hell for me <laughs> so 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 uh, h- how many of you guys just just through the the 12 weeks god has done something in you right okay so watch this this is something god put in my spirit to be a benefit to you guys so heaven is rejoicing. You're experiencing the joy of it. The devil is mad, not just at you, but he's targeting the one that God used to implement it. So, so, so wa- watch this, watch this. So I've been going through, but, but part of taking teeth out of the devil is not rejoicing 
in fluctuating situations, putting your joy in something that's forever steady. So when your joy is anchored in something steady, it doesn't matter what the waves do, you always got joy. So no matter whatever happens, he says rejoice, not in your job, not in your paycheck, not in what naturally happens. Rejoice in what, y'all? Verse 2, his warning is, watch out for those people who say. <laughs> now, the, the context is circumcision. Of course, you can read the text. That's the context. But the principle is self-effort because those people say for you to have true joy then you should have accomplished these things. And if you hadn't accomplished these things, you don't need to be happy for nothing. You shouldn't be rejoicing in nothing. So Paul is going to refute this. Understand, again, context, circ circumcision, but principle, rejoice in the Lord. Watch out for people who say that your joy should be based on certain things. So Paul says, verse number three, for we who worship by the Spirit of God, are the ones who, truly, who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence. Somebody show no confidence. No confidence in human efforts. So Paul says, all of my trophies on the wall, all of my certificates, all of my awards, all the accolades that I've received, he says, put no confidence in your human achievements. None. Come on, somebody. Because what they give you today, they can strip from you tomorrow. The, 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 the record that you break today, somebody will break it tomorrow. God, I love it. God, I love it. So verse number four, he says, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I even more. Paul getting ready to brag, y'all. I'm talking about he getting ready to seriously, seriously brag. He's going to say in verse number five, he says, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel. Watch this. I didn't move into Nagaport. I was born now, you heard? Eight days. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was. Y'all, y'all, this boy, he like, I'm a true gangster. I don't just rap about it. I... I, I Cat, 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 you understand? A member of the tribe of ben Benjamin, a real Hebrew, if there, if there ever was one, <laughs> you're looking at him right here. I was, a, I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was zealous that I harshly persecuted the church, and as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. But watch what he says. He, he, lists, he lists all of these human achievements, all, all the things that anybody, if they know about anything, they would look at him and they would say, Paul, you the man. But this is Paul's final response. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them, <sighs> KJV says, dung, worthless because of what Christ has done. Oh, man, this is so good. I, I pray. I pray you get this. Yes, everything else is, somebody shout, worthless. When compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. I'm done. Paul says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, okay? This is why it was impossible for Paul to experience shame because he based his value not on what he had, but he based his value based on who loved him. So, so watch this. I'm, I'm, I'm coming to a close. I'm, I'm wrapping up, Chris. So this is what I notice about my, my children, my, my babies. All of my children, they have, a, right now, 
right now. They've, they've gone through difficult. When I look at all of them right now, all of my children have a high level of confidence. I noticed that. They, they just high level of confidence. Like for instance, Aisha, she talking about some I fight a man <laughs> over the burrito bar or whatever, fajita bar. <laughs> I will hit you in your face over these fajitas. It just, I, 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 I noticed that. If, if y'all noticed Teresa, she was up here dancing last Sunday, and she'll look and see if they're doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> she'll stop dancing <laughs> at any point. I, I, I noticed that. But, but out of all of my kids, Nathaniel is the one. I'm telling you right now, it is close to impossible to shame him. I'm serious. If you try to shame him, he'll make up a story. I'm serious. Oh, nay, ah, you wasted all of that. I wanted to do that. That's why I fell. If I didn't want to do it, I wouldn't have wasted it. I'm, I'm serious. It's, it's close to impossible to, to shame that boy. He, he just, it just, whatever. So, so, I, I it didn't, it didn't click until, I mean, really, maybe an hour ago. And this, this was the situation with, with, with Nathaniel. Uh, with my wife, um, a few, few days, a few weeks after she, she had him, she goes into the hospital. She almost dies. So seven days, seven nights, uh, she's in the hospital. I'm practically living in the hospital. So uh, Mother Bobby at that time, she she moves in and she basically is taking care of the kids because my wife is sick in the hospital. I'm sleeping in the hospital because I'm just not going to leave my wife. Make sure the baby's okay. So she steps in at a critical time. Nate is a baby. So so watch this. Literally, from, from, the, from the womb, he has been the most, I'm going to say it two ways, most babied but from his perception, most loved. Mother Bible was there. I'm there. My wife is there. He got a big brother always picking on him. He got sisters always picking on him. Church always picking at him and just, just loving on him. So it seems like he has been the most loved in the family. This is what that equates to. No matter what I do, it's okay because I got people that love me. I'm not perfect. Yeah, I spilled it, but I'm not that spill. <laughs> no, I didn't get it, but I'm okay. This is what Paul's confidence is. He says, I achieve this, that, this, that, this, that. But out of all the stuff I achieve, what really defines me is not what I've done, but who loves me. I need, I need, I'm, I'm bringing it home. I need you to see it, and I'm done. I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best, Jesus. I embrace Paul is saying that the God of the universe cares so much about me. He knows the number of hairs in my head right now. As messed up as, I mean, he, he gives his failures in other places. I persecuted the church. I did all types of crazy things, but out of all of my failure, I'm still the apple of his eye. You love me so much, you'd be willing to make that type of sacrifice for me? You would give up your only begotten son for me? This is how you eradicate shame. Some of us are using the world standard to get rid of shame by trying to accumulate more stuff. Here's the problem with that. Every time you achieve something, they'll move the standard. So you got to keep achieving. You got to keep. And sooner or later, you'll realize that you'll climb, climb the corporate ladder to the top and find out ain't nothing up there. 
There's more money up there. There's nothing up there. Mm -mm. Because money can't feel the true needs of the human heart. What feels that need is love, man. So this is what I want to share with you guys. Bring it down just, just, a, just a bit, Chris. Just a bit. I'm telling you today that God loves you. God, God loves you. I'm serious. God, God loves you. I was talking to my son the other day, and I, I told my boy, I said, look at me. I'm your number one fan. I said, I'm your number one fan. You know what it's like. Some of y'all know exactly what it's like to be like a Fairweather fan. You with the team as long as they win it. Or you like me. I'm not a I'm not a Heat fan. I'm not a Lakers fan. I'm just like a LeBron fan. So I may put on a Lakers jersey, but as soon as he move, I'm moving. <laughs> I'm gonna put on another shirt. I don't know. But this is what a real fan. I'm t this is what a real fan does. We, we went to a basketball game last night, Harrison Central and uh, Biloxi High. As soon as I saw the outcome of the game, as soon as I knew the game wasn't even over, as soon as I knew who was going to win, I'm out. Because I ain't no real fan for them. But this is what a real fan do. <laughs> the real fan is the guy that's sitting on the bench, half naked with a T-shirt off, with a big letter or a number on his chest. <laughs> Watch this. He don't wait. He stays the entire game and cheers the entire game. Even if they losing, he going to sit there. And when the game is over, he still ain't going nowhere because he's trying to see what could the team have done better. I say I'm your number one fan because I cheer for you not just when you winning, but I ain't going nowhere when you losing. And I'm telling you, Jesus says, I'm your number one fan. I ain't going nowhere. I see how you acting. Look, I see how you doing me. I ain't going nowhere. I love you that much. I know what the world is trying to do. Stop looking at them. Stop listening to what they say. And hear what it don't matter to Nate what they say about what he did and what they spill. I know I got people that really love me just for me. And God loves you. Here's the question. Will you just receive that love today? I mean, will you just, just, just receive that love, man? Just, just, when you start doing stuff, don't do it for his love. Do it because of his love. Do it because he loves you. So receive it today. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Today there's somebody in this place where you kind of know the story, but you never actually really received it. You tried to be a better person. Tried to work hard.